Test, 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 test.
Is this working? <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. We're going to get started here because we're at 630. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming tonight and thank everyone for joining us remotely as well, because we have quite a few people signed up. My name is Mallory Bishop. I'm the municipal clerk here for Dysart. Um, this session is actually being hosted jointly with Dysart, Algonquin Highlands, uh, Minden Hills, and Highlands East. And we have election officials that are lined along the back there if you have any questions for anyone after the session as well. Um, we really are pleased to welcome Fred Dean with us to Halliburton County tonight. Fred's a municipal coach and a former municipal solicitor, and he has extensive experience in municipal governments. He's delivered numerous orientation and counselor training sessions across Ontario, and uh, he's also worked with municipal administrators for years. Um, tonight's session will provide an overview of the roles and responsibilities council members and explain how public office will impact your life. So we have a lot to learn from Fred tonight. And Fred, please take it away. Thank you. Well, good evening and welcome. Let me start by saying congratulations to those of you who are thinking of uh, running for municipal council, whether you decide to or not, based on a number of factors, including some of the things you might hear tonight. Uh, I think it's important that you give some thought to giving back to your communities and, and being a member of council puts you in the position of being a, a, a leader of your community. And that's really significant and it's really important. I get the opportunity to speak to a lot of municipal councils and staff at, at conferences and whatnot. And I have to tell you, I've been doing these sessions for, this is the fourth election now. And I think this is the most important session that I deliver every four years, because it really gives you an insight as to whether it's appropriate or not. And I can tell you this, at every session I've done, virtually every session I've done over those number of years, one person will at the end of the session say to me, that was really interesting, I'm not gonna run. And that's good because they, they had a misconception of what being on council was all about. What they, they simply didn't understand the parameters of it. So I wanna take you through tonight and, and do a number of different things This is the important part of the evening to see if the screen changes when I push the button. It does. Uh, you heard about me and it's in there. Let's keep moving. What we're gonna to do tonight, we're gonna to, uh, start uh, with talking about local government. So we're gonna do a course called Municipal Government 101, which when I deliver this to staff or to council members takes anywhere from a day to three or four days. And we're gonna do it in about seven minutes. 
We'll get everything that, that you need within those seven minutes and we'll move forward with it. Uh, I then want to talk about municipal powers and where powers come from and who has the power within municipalities and what it means. And, and, and we'll talk about that aspect. We're also going to talk about accountability and transparency. Uh, there is no question that local government is the most accountable, most immediate, and most transparent level of government that there is. And it's important to understand that if you get into it, because it, it creates a set of dynamics that you might not have expected. I want to talk about who's responsible for doing what. The, and I refer to it as roles and responsibilities. Often, if you get this wrong, there's some real problems in, in the municipalities. And I've experienced that over the years. But if you get it right, wow, have you ever got something going for it? It's really special. So we'll spend some time on that. Then we're going to shift gears and we're going to talk about some personal considerations. We're going to talk about what happens if you win. And then we're going to talk about how your life changes and how your family's life change. And we'll spend some time dealing with that issue. I then want to talk about confidentiality and codes of conduct for members and conflict of interest. And that'll pretty much take up the next hour, an hour and a half or whatever, uh, and get us through it. I've been asked, you know, what do you look for when, you, when you're looking for people who should run for council? What is appropriate? And I always look for two things. First, I look for integrity, person having integrity. And the second, I look for a vision, someone who has a vision for their community and where they want to see the community go. And those two components in a person, I think, can make a huge impact on the council and on the community at large. So we're getting close to the magic day. Magic day is uh, May 2nd, that uh, nominations open. And you have from May 2nd right through to August 19th at two o'clock to put your name in to run. And the, the people at the back of the room, the clerks are the experts on the election process and, and all the issues you need to, to know. And they're there to help you out. And that's true in all 444 municipalities across the province. They're, they're really good. Municipal elections are, are complicated elections. They're much more complicated than federal or provincial because you're dealing with council, several positions on council, you're dealing with school boards, a uh, number of different issues. So they, they, they have, a, in my experience, the clerks have a really good handle on the process and how it, how it operates. So let's get started. I thought we could start by putting you to work, at least for a few minutes, because I think this is an interesting exercise. Uh, and it's very simple. And the question is, what does local government do for you? What does local government do for you in your community? And, and if I'm doing these virtually, I, I don't spend a lot of time on this, but because we have people here in the room, I'd like to spend just a few minutes extracting from you some of the things local government does for you. And I don't want you to think at the 30,000 foot level, I want you to be back down about the 50 foot level or even lower. I want you to get into detail, not into broad schemes. So let's, let me give you an example. If someone were to say roads, that's a 30,000 foot answer. Tell me some of the things relating to roads that your municipality does for you. Anybody? It's not a trick question. Yes. Plow. Plow. Yeah. Winter maintenance. Absolutely. Another one. All the maintenance, whether it's summer maintenance or winter maintenance. Yeah, it's a big part of the program. Uh, people always say winter maintenance this time of year because you've just been through a horrible bunch of events over this winter. What's another road road um, issue? Paving. Paving. Paving, sure. Maintenance of roads and upgrading them and, and that sort of thing. What's another one? Oh. Yeah, re regulation, speed limits, stop signs, parking, all that sort of thing. What's another one? 
yeah, ditches and culverts. And, and that kind of leads you to something else. The roads are used uh, to transport things like water, but they're also used for utilities. There are a lot of utilities under municipal roads and all those have to be contracted and all those have to have an agreement with the municipality. Anything else? Clerks are sitting at the back saying, I, I know this, I know this, but we're not gonna let them answer. Yeah. Bicycles. Yeah, bicycles becoming a bigger thing also. I, I live now in the center of Toronto uh, and I can tell you on an average day, I see more bikes, I think, than I do cars. It's really taking over. What else? What goes along sort of with bicycles? Buses, Buses. Buses yeah, transit. Pedestrians. So you'll have walkways or sidewalks, whatever, to pedestrians. What else about roads? Well, municipalities create them. They get created on plans of subdivision. The municipality may build a road itself. So they build them, they create them and they build them. Uh, one example of, of a number of things municipalities are involved with when it comes to, to roads. Roads generally are the biggest budget item for municipalities. It's a huge ticket item. What's another uh, activity of municipalities, another service that's provided? Fire, what goes along with fire? Ambu land ambulance and police, yeah, sure. And fire breaks down into uh, fighting fires and, and uh, inspections and all the sort of things that go along with that. What's another service? We're running out of steam at about number eight, come on. Okay, good one. Let, that's the 30,000 foot answer. Now bring it down to some detail. Programming. Okay. Yeah, cleaning up parks. What else? Facilities, important part of it. Uh, yeah, there, some places have trails. I don't know if you have trails here, ski trails or skidoo trails or whatever, snowmobile trails, important aspects. What's another service? Collect property tax. Some people, you know, might think that's not a service, but in fact it is. Lower tier municipalities uh, collect taxes for themselves, but they also collect it for local boards and they collect it for the county. So it, it, it's an important service. What's another service municipalities provide? Policing. Policing, we got that with fire and, and ambulance medical. It's an important one, yep. What's another one? Waste management. Waste management, all kind, that fits all kinds of categories. Waste management in terms of recycling, in terms of um, having the picking the garbage up and then taking it to a site, landfill site. Uh, food, I don't know if you're collecting food separately here, but that's a big issue in some communities. Okay, another 10 seconds. Can you give me one or two more? Oh yeah, planning is really significant. What does planning do for you? Yep, those are all things. I wanna stick with planning for just a moment. Yep, severances. One of the most important documents in your municipality is the official plan. It is the picture of your community 20, 25, 30 years out from now. And every document, every planning document fits within that official plan. It's a really significant document. It gives you the sense, the whole planning process of where your community is going, where it's right now, and it's really significant. All right, we're gonna stop. There's a lot more. There's probably over 120 uh, services. One of the ones I wanted to mention that, that's a bit unique in a sense, and that is there are some services that are provided that, that by your local municipality, but they're not provided by the municipal uh, organization itself. They're provided by what are called local boards. Local boards, the best example I can give you, everyone knows is the library. 
If, if the community wants a public library, council cannot offer it. Council can create a public library board and that's the board that offers that service and, and is responsible for the uh, delivery of that service within your community. There are other local boards, conservation authorities, health units, uh, that all have separate relationships with the municipality. Uh, and those relationships are defined by provincial uh, statutes and regulations. And we'll come to that in just a few minutes. Okay. Put yourself, uh, if you have a chance, take a piece of paper and see if you can get up to 100 services your local government provides. There are more. Here's why it's important. Those are the responsibility of the municipal council. And a lot of them are really highly regulated, really technical, and have huge impacts on health and safety within your community. We didn't talk about water, sewer and water. They're highly regulated. And I'm going to talk about water at the end of the tonight, just to give you a, a sense of the importance of that within your community. Let's talk about municipal powers just for a few minutes. Municipalities have no inherent jurisdiction. By that, I mean they can't just do whatever they want to do. They have to find the authority for what they do from the province. It either comes in a statute or a regulation, but all municipal, municipal powers come from the province. We've heard the, the expression that municipalities are creatures of the province, and, that, and that's pretty true. And that was reaffirmed this last year by the Supreme Court of Canada in the city of Toronto case. The, you may recall in the last election in 2018, right in the middle of the campaign, I think it was August, the province reduced the size of city council in Toronto by half. And lawsuit ensued and at the end of the day, the Supreme Court said the province had the power to do that. Was it a good thing to do? Probably not, but had the province did have the authority to do it. So all the powers the municipality has, all of those powers come from the province. 2001 was a really significant year in municipal government in Ontario. And I say that because for 150 years, there had been a municipal act and it had never been rewritten front to back for 150 years <laughs> until 2001. And 2001 created a new act that turned the municipal environment upside down. Let me give you an example. Before 2001, Municipal Act recognized specific types of municipalities, townships, villages, and townships, uh, and towns, and small cities, and big cities. And the powers were given to those municipalities based on their size. And they were named the township of, or the village of, uh, whatever. And all the powers that went to them were based on the size of the municipality. 2001, that all disappeared. Today, there are only three kinds of municipalities in the province. First is single tier. Single tier is all of Northern Ontario and a few select municipalities in the South. And here's the key. All of that bundle of powers that comes from the province, single tier municipalities get it all. They have all of that power. So that if you're the township of Ear Falls in Northwestern Ontario or the city of Ottawa, you have the same powers. That wasn't the case pre-2001. You're not single tier municipalities, you're in a two tier structure. You're in the county system. The county is the upper tier. Uh, there are other upper tiers, regions and a district, Muskoka is a district. And then within the geographical boundaries of that county, there are a number of lower tier municipalities or local municipalities, townships, towns, um, can be cities in some cases. And in that situation, the bundle of powers that comes from the province gets divided 
split up and it gets divvied up differently in different parts of the province. So the powers you have between upper and lower tier might differ in some significant ways from say Renfrew County uh, or Hastings County. It's all in the legislation and it's all how the province has, has uh, given you that authority. By the way, you can't tell anymore by the name of the municipality how big it is. There's a city in Northwestern Ontario, city of Dryden, has a population of, of about 8,500 people. There's a town, part of the GTA called Oakville, population of about 200,000 people. Uh, you can't tell. The other thing too, a number of municipalities now go by the title of the municipality of. So the municipality of Red Lake, that's its formal name. You can't tell the size of a municipality anymore by the name it has. And in fact, the municipalities now have the ability to change the name of the municipality. If they don't wanna be a township, they can be a municipality or, or a town or whatever. In fact, Dryden is currently looking, as I understand it, to change its name from city to town because they, the population they don't feel is, is, meets the test of what a city should be. When this act came out in 2001, and it's, it's a good doorstop, it's two and a half inches thick, it's pretty substantial. Uh, if you're thinking of running for council and someone says to you, you should read the Municipal Act, ignore them. It's really bad advice. You know, better off to use it as a doorstop to try to read it. It's technical. There are lots of other ways to get information, but reading that statute is not the best way. But there's a section I came to right near the beginning, section five, and, and I read it over and over and over because it was so simple and short. But here's what it says. It says, all powers of municipality shall be exercised by council and shall be exercised by bylaw. Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say power shall be exercised by members of council or by the mayor or by, the, by staff. Power shall be exercised by council. That's really fundamental. And it's kind of the basis that we build everything on for the rest of this evening. Municipal powers given by the province are exercised by bylaws of the council, passed by council. So let's go and take a look at what I think are some basic principles. I've talked about it being complex and highly technical and it is. Uh, Pass a bylaw, the powers have to be exercised by uh, or at a duly constituted meeting. And here's what I mean when I refer to a duly constituted meeting. First is the municipality has to tell the public it's holding a meeting. So it has to give notice. And that notice has to be given for all council meetings, both regular ones, and special ones, it has to be given for committee meetings. It has to be given for both open meetings and meetings that are closed to the public. The obligation is to give notice of all meetings. And that notice now will be on the website, the municipality. Years ago, we used to publish notice in the newspaper, the local newspaper all the time, but that, that day is gone. So notice is really significant. And with that notice comes the agenda and comes the material supporting that agenda, the reports and the recommendations that come from staff. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes. The second principle of a duly constituted meeting is it must be open to the public. Whether you're in the room together or it's virtual, the public has a right to access public has a right to observe. In fact, the courts have said consistently that the most important element of the public attending council meetings is the ability to observe. 
you are observing how decisions are made. It's really basic, it's really fundamental. The third principle is there has to be a quorum present. I always work with a council of five because I'm not good at math and I run out of fingers. So we're gonna deal with a council of five people. What's quorum for a council of five? Well, it's a majority of the members, which means three. So if, if five members are present, you can have a meeting and you can have a meeting if three members are present. That's the quorum and that's what you must meet. The next part of the test is a really important one and that is majority prevails. So if, again, if we have five members of council present at a council meeting, three members have to vote in favor in order to carry the bylaw or resolution. If you only have three members present though, how many have to vote in favor of it? Two, exactly. Interesting, eh? Less than majority of members of council exercise the power of the corporation by voting in favor of the bylaw. The final principle is that everybody votes and that includes the head of council, the mayor or the reeve, uh, everybody has a vote at, at municipal council, which makes uh, the head of council a somewhat unique position. Uh, and I'll talk about that in just a few minutes. So that's that, there are the elements of a duly constituted meeting. You have to give notice, it has to be open to the public, it has to be a quorum present, majority prevails, by the way, majority prevails means if you're on council, you need to have, on my, my council of five, you need to have at least two friends if you're gonna get something that you want through. Otherwise, you're gonna have a level of frustration with it all. I said before that municipal governments are the most accountable, transparent level of government. And that's absolutely true. Uh, in fact, there used to be a, a statement on the provincial website with, uh, in relation to the cabinet. We saw some statements by the federal cabinet not within the last week that decisions made at cabinet meetings are confidential and are not available to be seen or reviewed by the public. That's not the case in municipal government. We just see it has to be open to the public. Decision making has to be made in public and you do so uh, by observing. Uh, we have to make a decision here. This is important. Do we take questions as we go or keep them at the end? Let's start taking them as we go. And if it doesn't work, we'll leave them to the end. Yes. Well, that's a question you'll have to ask somebody who's an expert on federal government. I've never understood it. Uh, but uh, cabinet confidentiality uh, has been a principle of government in Canada since 1867. So do I agree with it? No, I, but I think it's important to understand the distinction between local government decision-making and public. Talk to your MP. Want to talk about, yes. Okay, let's deal with accountable or, and, and transparent government. The obvious one that I've talked about is, is the fact that meetings have to be open to the public where decisions or policy is set. Uh, there is provision in the Municipal Act for closed meetings. And closed meetings are appropriate in some circumstances, both for council and committees of council. But there, there are elements built into the legislation that make it accountable and transparent again. The list of subject matters for which a council can go into a closed meeting is set out in the Municipal Act. And it, a council cannot go in for just any reason at all. It must fit within one of those subject matters. Secondly, in order to go into a closed meeting, council must pass a resolution in public. And that resolution says, hey, we're gonna hold a closed meeting. 
And here's the subject matter of that closed meeting. That's part of the transparency. And when they're in the closed meeting, they can't deal with anything else. They're limited to the matter referred to in that public resolution. The third thing that's set out in the legislation is what can they do at closed meetings? Well, there, there's ability to vote, but there's certain types of votes that are allowed and others that aren't. So the province, again, has restricted fairly considerably, and it's part of this transparency regime, if you will. On the right side of the screen are a list of council policies. And these are policies that have all been adopted uh, by all 444 municipalities across the province. And they are intended not to be dust collectors, but they're intended to be active policies updated from time to time. I only want to refer to two of them uh, tonight, but you can see the list there. The first one I want to refer to is a policy called the accountability and transparency policy. If you're thinking of running for council, you need to read this policy. Go find it. It should be on your municipality's website. And it is a policy that indicates how your municipality is attempting to ensure that it is both accountable and transparent and what those words mean. Kind of a valuable document if you're thinking of running for council. It's really important to take a look at. The other policy I want to have a look at, the, the bottom two on the list are relatively new. Uh, but the one second from the bottom talks about a policy dealing with council members and staff and the relationship between council members and staff. Notice it doesn't say council. It says council members. This is individual to individual. And this policy gets tied into the code of conduct for members of council. It's an important one and the province has been putting more emphasis on this relationship between council members and staff. And, and so that's a policy that's come into effect and it, uh, it's, we're seeing some play on it around the province. I said before that roles and responsibilities actually gives me quite a bit of work during the four year term of council because I get calls all the time saying we've got problems. Uh, there's some difficulty in the organization. Can you come and help us out? It's important to understand that the province has put in the legislation job descriptions for council, for the head of council, for staff. And if you get this right as an organization, things really work. And if you get it wrong, you get off the rails pretty quickly. So I want to spend a few minutes talking to you about the roles and responsibilities as set out by the province, because uh, I think they're, they're important to keep in mind. And, and this may have an impact on what you think your job is going to be if you're elected as a member of council. So here's a brief list of, of what's in the act for council. No surprise, council exercises corporate powers. Municipalities are corporations and council is like the board of directors, if you will, of this municipal corporation. It has vastly more powers than a corporate power does. Uh, but council exercises power, that's section five again, we saw that earlier. So, that's the starting point. Council represents the public, and that's appropriate. In fact, you will not see that phrase in the job description for staff. Members of council are out in the community. You're talking to people, you're bringing the concerns of your the people in your community to the council table, and that's part of the decision-making and policy-setting role that you have. So this, this uh, this whole area of um, representing the public is a really important one and people um, expect you to be paying attention to what their concerns are. The next one's interesting and it says the council has to consider the interest and well-being of the municipality. And when you read that, municipality has two meanings. The first meaning is your community, 
the geographical boundaries. Council has an obligation to take into account the best interests and well being of your community. But municipality also means the municipal corporation. Members of council have to act in the best interests of the municipal corporation. So that's legislated, but actually municipalities also contract that. Policies of insurance that municipalities have, and there are a number of them, provides that not only do members of council have to act in the best interests of the municipal corporation, so do staff. So it's legislated, but it's also contractual. And, and it just makes sense that you were, if you are on the council, you are acting in the best interests of the municipal corporation itself. The next one we've covered, we, we talk about you act collectively, you act publicly, and you give notice. All basic things, and that's in the act. The thing that is not there is that there is no responsibility, management responsibility given to any member of council. If you think you're being elected to manage a department or to run, um, uh, direct how work is done, that's not your job. And in fact, I'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later and in terms of the impact that that can have on, on your organization. Uh, the province has clearly set a line between the role of council as decision maker, policy setter, and the role of council or, or the role of staff as providing advice and, and doing the, the, the labor that's required to fulfill the mandate. If you are elected to council, part of the orientation that you will receive will lay out some of the limitations. I'm not gonna get into them tonight, but some of the limitations uh, imposed upon individual members of council. You, you don't have um, as broad a power that you might think you do. That power that you have sits at the council table as part of this decision-making body. So what does the province say about the head of council? Remember I talked about the 2001 act? Before that came into effect, there were the, the municipal act recognized mayors and reeves and wardens and chairs. And they all represented a, a, the head of council of a certain type of municipality. So if you're, a Reeve, do we have any Reeves in this county? All mayors, okay. Townships used to be Reeves. Villages used to be Reeves. Mayors were for towns and cities. Wardens are the head of council for a county. So you have a, you have a warden, that title continues. And chairs are the head of council for regions. There's one municipality in the province that has a completely different name uh, or different title. And that municipality refers to the head of title as the Lord Mayor. Do you know where that is? Anybody know where that is? It's Niagara on the Lake. And Niagara on the Lake was given that power by special legislation back in either the 70s or the 80s. I can't remember. Today, any member, any council could change the title to its head of council. In fact, that happened in Renfrew County. This is 10 years ago or so now. All the townships, and there are a number of townships in Renfrew County, got together and they talked and they said, we don't think Reeve is the appropriate title anymore for a head of council. Mayor is more appropriate. People recognize the title of mayor and they understand what it is. So they, by bylaw, section five, they exercise power, change the title of the head of council from Reeve to mayor. And let's be clear, council is not limited by those handful of names. They can pick another name. If council wanted to have the Grand Poobah, it could do that. Nobody's decided to do that yet, but the ability is there in council by, again, passing a bylaw. So the Municipal Act in 2001 took out all those titles and now just refers to the head of council. 
And the powers of a head of council, whether it's at the lower tier or at the upper tier, whether it's a city or a township, are all the same. Head of council, the responsibilities are all the same. So let's go through the list quickly. This is just a summary of it. First thing is heads of council preside at council meetings. No surprise there. There's only one municipality in the province where that's not true, and that's the city of Toronto. And that came about because Mayor Lastman, Mel Lastman, uh, didn't like chairing council meetings. And frankly, I wouldn't like to chair a council meeting in Toronto either, because it goes for four, three days usually. Uh, what an awful place to be for three days. Uh, so the province changed the legislation for Toronto and the, the mayor can have someone else appointed to be the chair of the council meetings. Makes sense in the Toronto circumstance. But for the rest of the province, the other 443 municipalities, the head of council chairs the council meetings. And I can tell you, sitting in the chair of the mayor or the warden is a very different experience than sitting as a councillor. It's a very different view of the world and very different responsibilities that come with it. Uh, presiding over council meetings is a, is a really important uh, element. And in fact, the, the legislation goes way beyond what this says, because it says that the, the meetings must be chaired efficiently and effectively. That means mayors need to be prepared. That means mayors need to be trained on how to be effective in the role. And there is training. I've had the chance to do that with a lot of mayors around the province over the last 15, 20 years. The act also goes on and says that the head of council provides leadership to council. Interesting wording. It doesn't say leadership to the organization. It says leadership to council. That's because on the staff side, the chief administrative officer provides leadership to the staff. That distinction again is made. The next one is really significant, really important and distinguishes the head of council from the other members of council. And that is the head of council speaks on behalf of the municipality. Other members of council don't. So how do they know what to say? Well, if they're speaking on behalf of the municipality, how does the municipality speak? Council speaks by passing bylaws and passing resolutions. So the mayor has an obligation to speak on behalf of the, the resolutions and bylaws that have been passed by the council. That authority is given to the mayor, it is not given to other members of council. Yes, sir. Oh, we're coming to that. You're one slide ahead of me. I love when you're one slide ahead of me. I'll answer your question in detail in just a minute. Really good question. The question was, does that mean the mayor is the CEO of the municipality? Um, stick with me, we'll get there. Some of the other leadership responsibilities you can see on the last bullet point provide, the mayor has a responsibility to provide leadership and information um, or information and, and uh, advice to recommendations to council on a number of matters. That's part of that leadership role. The head of council is the chief executive officer of the municipality. This has been an interesting debate over the years and it came to a head in 2006 because before that time, the act said that the head of council was the chief executive officer but it never said what that meant. And so some mayors took it to mean, well, CEO, everybody understands a CEO is the day-to-day -day manager of the organization. That's from business background. And other people said, you should get rid of the term. The province should get rid of the term and, and just make it disappear. The province decided instead of getting rid of it to define it and they have put a definition in the legislation as to what it means. And if you read it, there's about five parts to it. At the end of the day, what it means is the head of council is not the CEO in, in the same context as a CEO in business. 
that responsibility rests in the municipal world with the chief administrative officer, the CAO. What it means, if you read those four or five or six points in the act, is that the head of council, the mayor, is the champion or the cheerleader of the municipality. Most of you will have heard of the mayor, former mayor, Hazel McCallion. Mayor McCallion was the ultimate who understood that she was the champion for Mississauga. You could never meet Mayor McCallion when she wouldn't tell you how wonderful Mississauga was. And they were the first words out of her mouth. And why was Mississauga so wonderful? Because of the people. She understood her role. She understood her role was not to be part of administration, but to be performing this leadership role, not only for council, but for the community. I should talk about two people on the administrative side just really quickly. First is the CAO, and we'll come to that in a second, but the CAO is the, the leading staff member, it's the most senior staff member and reports directly to council. It's responsible for reports that go to council uh, and for day-to-day -day administration of the organization. The other person I wanted to mention is the municipal clerk. Municipal clerks are what are referred to in the business as statutory officers. And that means that they are appointed by bylaw. When they are appointed, they get this whole bundle of responsibilities that come at them that are set out in provincial statutes and regulations. Clerks, an example, treasurer, chief building official, the minute they're appointed, they have responsibilities under this regulation called the, the building code. So they in effect have two job descriptions, one given by the municipality and the other given by the province. We all know one of the responsibilities for the clerk is to run the election. They're the chief electoral officer for, the, for municipalities across the province. But they have responsibilities around council meetings, the, keeping the minutes, uh, a number of the, the, they're into licensing of marriages and various other things. Huge responsibility in a number of different areas. Why am I telling you about just these two people? Because I think if you're thinking of running for council, you need to talk to them. Have a chat with them about any questions you have, whether it's policy or the election. They're worth having a conversation with. If you haven't met the clerk of your municipality, don't leave tonight without saying hello. It's an opportunity and I encourage you to do it. Oh, the one last thing I want to be clear, there's nothing in the legislation that gives the mayor any management responsibilities, none. That rests with the staff side. And that's really fundamental to the entire process and how, how the municipality operates. The section in the act dealing with staff, I think is really well written. The first thing it says is staff will undertake research and provide uh, advice to council. What does that mean? Well, basically it means written reports going to council meetings with recommendations. Every report should have a recommendation and that recommendation should be the motion that council is being asked to, to pass. That becomes the primary source, staff have an obligation to do that, provide that advice, and council has an obligation to receive it. That means that council, uh, the primary resource for information to council comes from staff, and the province has set that up in just that way. It's really important. Once council makes a decision, then staff have an obligation to implement that decision. That's fundamental, whether staff recommended it or not, at the end of the day, staff implement it. And finally, staff have an obligation under the legislation to create policies and procedures. These policies and procedures are not council policies. These are just how the different departments run. I used to have a number of policies in my office, how we did certain things. Every department does, public works, rec, parks and rec, uh, treasury, every clerks, Everyone has them. This is just how the place runs on a day-to-day -day basis. 
So that's the staff role. We can see on all of this, there's a pretty clear line between the role of council and the role of um, the administration. They're very, very different. I've had this slide in, in my slide decks for probably 15 or more years. And everyone, every time I put a slide deck together, I decide, try to decide whether I want to keep it in or not. And I decide to because I love the image. Council should steer the boat rather than row it. Council sets the direction, council sets the course, sets the policy, makes the decision, and staff roll the boat. It's from a book back in, I think, the 70s by Osborne and Gabler. I'm not sure the book is particularly relevant anymore, but just the, the visual, I think, is a really, really useful one. I want to talk about municipal governance. Um, and in my world, municipal govern governance means how does council make decisions? What are the components of council making a decision? Because a really effective council means it's making really good decisions. And an ineffective council bounces all over the place. They're not particularly effective. Well, we've seen from, from what we just discussed that the Municipal Act says that staff is the primary resource for council. Staff prepares the reports, put the agenda together. People say staff prepare the agenda, but that's not entirely true. Council has prepared the agenda in that council in its procedure bylaw has set out the order of business. What items are gonna be dealt with at a council meeting? Staff simply populates those with the items that are current and have to go before council. So staff is a primary resource for council. Another resource though is, is committees. And the committee structure council has, I have to tell you, I said there were 444 municipalities. There's probably about that many different committee structures across the province and municipalities. There are all kinds of them. There's even a few municipalities, not many, who don't have any committees. It's a council of five members and, and those five members have said, we don't need committees. We can handle the workload and we can get the advice that we need. But committees form an important role within a municipality. And why does council create committees? Well, very simply in my world, council creates a committee to provide advice and to make recommendations. So it's another source of information coming to council to allow council to have that information to make a good decision. That's why you, as a council, you create committees. That's what, the, that's what their purpose is for. Another source of information is the public. Now the public will, will interact with members of council within the community, outside the council chamber. But in the council chamber, the role of the public, as I said before, what the courts have said is the primary role of the public is to observe. But the public also has the ability to make presentations to council council called delegations or de deputations. It's not a right. It's an ability based on, on what is in the procedure bylaw and what council will allow. So the public comes to the meetings as a delegation to provide advice and give information to council and try to convince council to, to proceed in a certain way on a particular issue. Uh, one of the issues I dealt with in the municipality not long ago is um, there were two factions. One faction was it takes so long to get anything through council at this municipality. It just seems to take forever. And the other faction is saying delegations are important and people should be able to be heard at committees and at council. And they were going around and around and the best rule that, that I've seen is that you, if you are a delegation, you get to be heard once, either at council or committee, because council has to get on with the business of government, it needs to get the information, but needs to make decisions, and, and the delegation should be appearing once. Committees play an important role. 
I talked about local boards and the fact that they're different and they have this relationship and each relationship's different depending on the legislation. So the relationship for a library board is based on the Public Libraries Act, Conservation Authority, Health Unit. Each legislation creates a, a link between the municipality and the local board. If you're thinking of running for council, if you're giving it serious thought, you better love meetings. I mean, you better really love meetings because you're gonna spend a lot of your life sitting in meetings. I had someone say to me not long ago, you know, I'm thinking of running for council because it's two meetings a month and they give you a check to, to do that. And I said, well, maybe you haven't quite got it right because the reality is you'll have two council meetings, maybe some special council meetings. You'll be on committees. You'll be on local boards like the library board and you'll be on community groups as well. You spend a lot of your time in meetings and you better get good at it. Counselors who do really well understand how to be good at meetings. It's a skill. There are techniques that you can use that make a huge difference. Uh, you better enjoy it because if you don't, you're gonna have a miserable four years and you better get good at it because it's the only way you're gonna achieve some of the things that you want to achieve as being part of council because we know this is a collective body. Meetings are really important, they're really significant. Municipalities, in my view, have to really focus on the length of council meetings. When I went to Sudbury, one of the primary concerns council had, and it was part of the process I went through, um, the question came and they asked me, so do you have any idea how to shorten the length of council meetings? Uh, ours start at 7.30. Well, they start at 6.30 for a closed meeting and then 7.30 and they never finished before midnight. And all the big decisions came after midnight, of course. And they said, this doesn't work for us. We need to shorten the meetings down. So council took some steps and got their meetings down to two hours or less on average. There are ways to do it. Council meetings are important in terms of time, but they make important decisions. And frankly, the longer you sit, the less effective decisions you make, in my experience over the years, and I've seen it time after time. Uh, so if you're thinking of running for council, really spend some time thinking about this concept of sitting in meetings uh, a lot of the time. I thought you should refer to the accountability and transparency policy. The other document I think you need to read is the procedure bylaw. And I describe the procedure bylaw as one of the two most important documents in the municipality. The other is, by the way, the annual budget, because it sets your policy. But the procedure bylaw does so much, that, and you need to have an understanding of this. It sets the rules for the meetings. Municipalities get to write their own procedure bylaw. How cool is that? Subject to some aspects the province uh, dictates. In addition to that, it defines relationships between the head of council, the mayor, and members of council, and between council and staff, and between staff and council and the public. It sets the governance model in terms of the committees that, that are there and what the mandate of the committees is. Well, I should say on, on council committees, council sets the mandate. That is, council determines what the committee is to do and it populates, it names the members to it. It's, it's really important document to read. You need to spend a bit of time. And it's, it, the, the better you get at understanding your procedure bylaw, the more effective you'll be at, at council. There's an expectation that the head of council will have a good knowledge of the procedure bylaw, but the expectation is even higher for clerks. Clerks are considered to be the expert, not to make rulings, but to give advice to counsel. Read it, take the time.
maybe I'll tell you why we're going to do this. We're going to take a two minute break, just two minutes. And you'll see in a minute why that's generous. I want everyone in the room to please stand up for those two minutes and we'll come back. We'll keep going. Really important. Two minute break. Okay, that's it. Back to work. So why would I do that? Interestingly, the regional chair at the region of York, this is four or five years ago now, announced that at regional council meetings in York, every hour on the hour, there would be a one minute recess. And everyone in the room had to stand up if they were able to stand up. And it was a minute. Don't run out of the room because the meeting's going to start again. And he said he wanted to do that because there are more and more studies coming forward that sitting for extended periods of time is a hazard to your health. And some studies have gone as far as to suggest that it comes close, equate the danger of smoking. So if you're sitting for too long, you could be causing problems. They talk about it on airplane flights too. Uh, so take a break. If your meetings are too long and whether you're even a couple hours, at some point during the meeting, stand up, it makes a difference. So I wanna shift gears now and I wanna talk about some personal considerations that I think you need to be paying attention to. So it's election night, the results have come in and you won and you are on cloud nine. Everybody loves me, you're gonna say. You'll learn pretty quickly that's not true, uh, but, but pretty elated in terms of the response and in terms of how people um, see you. And they will see you differently. From that night through the next four years, people will see you differently. People will see you as a leader of your community. People will see you as someone that they can approach and talk to at any time. And they expect that you will engage with them. It's really important. They're gonna see you differently. They're gonna to talk to you differently. And they're gonna do it all, all hours of the day. I had lots of counselors who told me they got a lot of emails between 10 and 11 on a Saturday night. It's a different world. And it doesn't go away, it's 24 seven. This job you are committing to is a 24 seven responsibility and it requires your total commitment. I've made a habit of talking to people who have left the municipality, whether they're staff or members of council, they're no longer on council, they're no longer staff. And I tend to talk to them about six months after they leave. And I ask them what the world is like and if there's any difference. And the reaction consistently is they had no idea 
the commitment that they gave to the municipality. They thought about it all the time. They just never escaped it. People were around all the time. Uh, one of the programs I was part of at one point was working with councillors, and one of the pieces of advice was get out of town. From time to time, you need to just get away from it and, and put on a different hat other than your councillor hat because you can't take it off within your community. And that's even more important in smaller communities than it is in large communities. I live in Toronto now, right in the center of the city. I wouldn't recognize my counselor if I walked, I know it's a him, but I don't know anything else. If I walked by him on the street, not surprising. He has somewhere between 70 and 100,000 constituents in his ward. That's one ward. That's not true in a small community. Everybody knows you. Everybody knows you. They know who you are. They know who your family is. Uh, the other thing that public believes is that you can fix all their problems. Uh, you can't. You might be able to, but you're going to need staff's help to do it in most cases. And there are times when you can't help because they're not municipal issues. Uh, but people don't see that. They think that, that you're in public office, you're a community leader, you can help them out. It, it's a bit of a challenge. As I said, it will consume you. I debate whether to tell this story. Uh, I put it in the slide as two tier. L let me tell it to you tonight because I think it's important to keep in mind. I was doing a session like this about 10 years ago, give or take, in Eastern Ontario, well into Eastern Ontario. And there was a former mayor who made a few comments to the group that was there. There were uh, a fair number of people there. And uh, he told the story of the fact that he had been a councillor on, on, on the township council and he decided to run for mayor. It may have been Reeve, but let's call it mayor for now. And he won. And he was pretty excited. He was pretty elated. And he went home that night and he said to his wife, I won. I won. I'm going to be the mayor and I'm going to be on county council. And his eight-year-old son came in the room and he said the same thing. I won. I'm going to be the mayor and I'm going to be on county council. And the eight-year-old said, I guess I lost. And he said that that instant changed his life in terms of the dynamics of his relationship with, with the municipality and his relationship with his family. And he recognized that he had to find the time. And it's really difficult if you get into local government to find the time for family things, particularly if you're the head of council. Uh, and I'll give you an exa example of that in a few minutes. Family issues really become important, and it's a conversation you have to have with your significant other and with your kids uh, as well. Uh, they are going to be subject to calls. They are going to be, it used to be answer the phone at home. Who's going to answer it? What are the rules around that? That's not as big an issue now with cell phones. But they're going to notice things on social media. They're going to see things that uh, may be a bit disturbing for them to read they're going to be confronted in their community. We had an issue in Sudbury at one point that related to store hours. And the council decided, Sudbury was the only municipality in the, in the province that had a store hours bylaw. And a councillor came to me and said, I want to extend the store hours, the ability of stores to open two more hours a week. And my reaction was, that's a really bad idea. But he said, no, no, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. So I prepared all the documents, put the report to council, and council approved it. Not surprising, members of council who went into stores and retail shops were really given a hard time by the owners and by the employees because they had these two extra hours a week they had to work. More importantly, their spouses were berated every store they went into. 
they took a lot of abuse because of two hours. That counselor, by the way, came back to me and said, we should have got rid of the bylaw. I said, yeah, that's what should have happened, but it didn't. So issues can arise and they are really, one of the things about local government is the issues are really impactful. They're really emotional from time to time. And that has an impact not only on the individual member, but also on family. You can expect when you go into the community, whether you're going shopping or getting gas, that people are gonna stop and wanna to talk to you. It's just the reality of it. You're gonna see it more and more as you get into it. There's another factor that impacts though on your family life. And that is that you, uh, this is something else you need to love in addition to meetings. You better love to read. I mean, you better really love to read. Uh, I made a comment a session not long ago that in Sudbury when I left, the average agenda was about 168 pages. And one of the clerks said, I wish they were that short for us. You have an obligation to read every page for two reasons. Firstly, the expectation is you will be prepared for the meeting. And you're only prepared if you've read the material. Uh, everybody in the room knows when the counselor asks a question, the answer of which is found in the third paragraph on page one, because they haven't read the report. But the other reason you need to read every item on every agenda is that buried in that somewhere could be a conflict of interest and you have an obligation to disclose it. And if you fail to, there are consequences. So you need to build into your time and it's relentless. This paper comes at you, whether it's paper, whether it's online, just comes at you week after week after week. It never stops. You better love to read and you need to be prepared for the meetings. I talked about micromanagement. Micromanage is where a member of council tries to direct staff to do work. Uh, it's inappropriate, it needs to be stopped, and it will have a huge impact on your organization. That's part of that policy I talked about earlier, your council member and staff. Uh, micromanagement can cause real issues, real difficulties. I did a couple of... Um, Integrity Commissioner reports just around that issue where members of council were demanding staff do work. Uh, it's not appropriate, it's not part of your job description. Incivility has been around for a long time, but it has really come to the attention in some communities in an incredibly significant way. Uh, Most councils after the election, the training will include training on uncivil behavior. Uh, it has a significant impact on the codes of conduct and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, there's one municipality in Northern Ontario that has spent half a million dollars on integrity commissioners and lawyers uh, around incivility. That's a lot of work in a community. You can do a lot of things with half a million bucks in your community, and it's being spent on lawyers and integrity commissioners. That's not appropriate. I'll talk about confidentiality in a few minutes. I think it's an important topic and one we need to spend some time with. But I want to talk about personal considerations in three contexts. I'm going to talk about codes of conduct for members, conflict of interest, and then I'm going to talk about water and just give you an example of the responsibility that comes with members of council uh, when it comes to regulatory responsibilities within, within the municipality. Up until just a few years ago, there, there were a few codes of conduct for members of council around the province, not a lot. And they all had uh, the codes that were different 
and they had integrity commissioners whose responsibility was to investigate and report back to council. That changed. And the province says that every municipality must now have a code of conduct for its members of council and must have an integrity commissioner. And that integrity commissioner's responsibility has been expanded. Not only investigations, but education. And something really interesting, the ability for members of council to ask for an opinion from an IC. That request has to come in writing and you will get a response as a member in writing. That's a new service and it's really helpful for members of council if they use it appropriately. The other thing the province did when they made it mandatory is they passed a regulation and said, you must cover off certain topics in your code of conduct. One of them is confidentiality, by the way. Some municipalities just use that list to develop their code. Council passes the code of conduct. Others add additional items. And, and frankly, I've never understood that. I'm a big fan of just doing what the province has set out in the regulation, what's appropriate. In the same vein, the, the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act comes under the, the purview, if you will, of the Integrity Commission. But I want to give you just a little bit of history and a little bit of background. This act came into effect in 1972. And it came into effect because members of council, some members of council said, I'd like to be able to contract with the municipality. And pre-1972, they were restricted. They couldn't do that. So this act allowed members to contract with, with municipalities to provide a service or whatever goods. And it's a piece of legislation that applies only to members of council and committees and local boards, it doesn't apply to staff. And it talks about pecuniary interests. Pecuniary means financial. So if you have a financial interest in a matter that is coming to council, you have an obligation to declare that pecuniary interest. Municipalities right at the beginning of their agenda for their meetings has an item, declarations of pecuniary interest and the general nature thereof. So if I am a member of council and I own Fred's widget shop on Maple Street, and I wanna supply widgets to the municipality, when that comes up at council, at the beginning of the meeting, I would say, your worship, I wanna declare a pecuniary interest on item four, because I own Fred's widget shop. The clerk would record that and put it in the minutes. And that's how it's been done since 1972. But a couple of years ago, the province changed it and added another layer to it and said, not only now do you have to do it verbally at the meeting, you must also now do it in writing, make the declaration in writing. And the clerk will take those two, the verbal as in the minutes and the written, and we'll put it into a registry. So anybody can go and see when members of council made the declaration or more interestingly, perhaps when they didn't. The advice I give to council members is write out what you're going to file as the written declaration and read it at the meeting so that those two items in that registry are exactly the same. It's really important to do because that's part of this accountability process that we talked about earlier. The ability of the public to see when you are in a situation where you have a pecuniary interest. There are a number of different pecuniary interests set out in the act, and I'm not going to get into detail on these. The obvious one is the direct one. That's the example I gave you. But there are others. There are family ones, parent, spouse, or child, if it's known to you, becomes yours. Uh, employer, employee situations, uh, 
shareholders or officers of corporations, uh, membership in a body. There are a whole different series of them that you need to be aware of and you need to be paying attention to. Uh, it takes a lot of work to keep up on this, especially we talked about committees before. There could be something coming to council from a committee that you're not on that has buried in it a pecuniary interest for you. That's why you need to be reading all of these documents. In 72, up until very recently, if, if an elector in your community had a complaint uh, or believed that a member had breached this act, their remedy was to go to court. And they had to pay for that. That was really a deterrent on people from bringing applications under this legislation. That changed. Now people can still go to court if they wish to do so, but they can also now file a complaint with the integrity commissioner who will investigate. And the integrity commissioner has the ability to send the matter to court. And the court will determine what penalty, if there's been a breach firstly, and if there is what the penalty would be. And that penalty is pretty, pretty extreme from one end to the other. Um, it could just be a reprimand all the way up to being removed from council and kept off council for up to seven years. The court can also award damages. So pretty significant in terms of the consequence. Uh, and what we're seeing because this ease of filing a complaint, oh, by the way, it's been expanded from electors to a much broader base of who's entitled to um, complain under this legislation. Number of complaints have gone up, not surprisingly. And here's the thing, the municipality pays for all this, not the person who complained. Uh, so we're seeing more complaints and it's costing some municipalities a lot of money at the end of the day. Members of council, carry around with them a lot of confidential information. They know things and it's either in their head or it's on a piece of paper or it's on a device. And they have to be aware all the time what information they have that is confidential. And it's really significant, it's really important. I said that it now has to be in the code of conduct and that it, Failure to maintain a confidentiality is a breach of the code, and that comes with consequences. Members of council need to be cautious about who they're speaking to and what the context is or who they're dealing with online and not providing confidential information. And in fact, it goes to the extent of not sharing confidential information with your spouse or family. Confidential means just that. And the expectation on you is, is significant. It's really high. I want to spend just a few minutes talking about water because I think it's an example. I have to ask the question, does every municipality here have water systems? No, uh, there's a man smiling in the front row, second, third row. How many of you have water systems? Only one? Okay. I'm going to tell you. Two. All right, two of the four. Walkerton is well known to everybody. Uh, tragic circumstances in a small community, southwestern Ontario. The province's response was to pass a piece of legislation called the Safe Drinking Water Act 2002. That act at the time was considered probably the best safe drinking water act in the world. It really set a new standard. And they created the Walkerton Clean Water Center, which does not supply water to Walkerton. It's a research center. It's a fabulous facility. It's really interesting. 
And the province brought this act into effect, but they didn't bring into effect the section that imposed personal liability on members of council. And so frankly, as a municipal sector, we kind of ignored that until the summer of 2012, when the province announced at the annual Association of Municipalities of Ontario conference that that section was coming into effect January 1st, 2013, and it did. And so we as a sector scrambled to begin to educate members of council as to what it meant to have personal liability and personal responsibilities. What was the standard of care imposed upon members of council in terms of being responsible for the supply of safe drinking water? And I was fortunate enough to be part of that training, which is really interesting. And I was doing a session at a conference in February or March. And about three weeks before that, there was a municipality in southwestern Ontario where charges had been laid by the MOE seven or eight years earlier. And they came to fruition and the municipality received a really significant fine. The chief water operator received a fine and a 30 day jail sentence. At the break, the mayor of that municipality was at the session and he came up to me and he said, do you think I could talk to this group? And I said, sure. And he said this. He said, council has been told by the municipal, the lawyers acting for the municipality that had that section been in effect, all of the members of council would have been charged. That's pretty significant. So members of council, if you have water systems, need to be trained. You need to understand what your responsibilities are. And this is an example of, of the technical regulatory environment that you are part of. Nobody expects you to be technical experts as a member of council on the supply of water or on some roads issue or on the safety of playground equipment in a park, but you need to understand what your duties and responsibilities are. And, and how you meet those and how you meet the test. And part of that is training and understanding the training. Uh, I tell the story not to scare you, but to make it clear that you have considerable responsibilities that come with the role and the position that you hold. So let's sum it up and see if we can get to some questions. Um, you need to understand your role. I've talked about that, municipalities that people who get it, understand what they're there to do and have a respect for what other people in the organization do function really well. And the municipalities that don't get that have problems. Powers rest with council, councils passes bylaws and, and gives that power to different people within the organization. Um, council members are not managers, you're not micromanagers, you don't direct work, leave that to your CAO and your, and your staff to, to um, implement the decisions council makes. Know what your personal obligations are. Expect that your municipality is going to train you really well after the election, part of the orientation process. Training for new councils um, is, is really important and really significant. Uh, there's a municipality now that is missing a member and we may be, we, put a suggestion in how to resolve a problem that they have. And, and we're suggesting that new member, even with just a few months left in the term, be trained in terms of the roles and responsibilities that are being taken on by that position. Talk to your family. It's an important family decision. Understand that this is a big commitment and it will consume you for the next four years. People will see you and listen to you in a very different way that they do now. I started off tonight by saying congratulations if you're thinking about it, and I really mean that. I think this is important for people to uh, take that opportunity. And uh, uh, if you decide to run, uh, it's a wonderful place to be. Councils are, in any 10 minutes, can be really rewarding and really frustrating and little upsetting. And, and great fun. 
and immediate. Decisions that you make are immediate. Uh, as I said at the beginning, integrity plays a significant role, and so does your vision for your community. If you can see where the community should be, should be moving, I think is really significant. Thank you for paying attention. Thank you for being part of this, uh, not only to the people here, but the people online as well. Do we have any questions? Yes, sir. Thanks, Michael. I came here with a bunch of questions. CAO is the senior administrator within the organization. Right. Well, so, uh, but that's not the mayor. No, it's not. The mayor is what? Mayor is the CEO. Okay. As defined by the municipal. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, Oh, who are the shareholders of the corporation? Everyone in the municipality. I don't have my share. No, well, you'll get your tax bill. It, it, it's not like a business corporation. There are no shares in municipal corporations. It, it is a very different entity than a business corporation. No, that's not true. I, I, let me give you an example. If there are all kinds of non-share corporations that are charitable organizations and whatnot. They don't have shares. They're set up through the province or the feds. Okay, so the province then that has the authority and power to dissolve that corporation has been set up. Am I correct there? Yep. No? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the province can set up or can change municipal governments. When I got into local government, which is a long time ago now, there were over 850 municipalities. Remember I said today there are 444. That's the province changing the structure of municipal government. When I left Sudbury, we were going through the amalgamation of the region and all of the, the local municipalities within the region into one municipality. And that was the province that created that. I, you need to lose, lose the wording CEO because you are getting it confused with business. You are, if you don't, if you are the mayor and you don't believe you're accountable to the people, you're a one term mayor. Of course, most not because of that. No, they're not. You got to you got to lose the term CEO. Take it out of your language. But you but you the the issue you're dealing with requires that you read the, what the province has said CEO means. And it doesn't mean what you think it means. It means champion of the municipality or cheerleader of the municipality and that's it. It does not mean the day-to-day -day administration. That's the CAO. It's a very different role. Any other questions? Yes. If we choose that uh, we are, are you know, we don't want to run, um, what other meaningful ways can we uh, can we involve ourselves in topics that are in our municipality and also affect our province and our Yeah. 
The question is, if you decide not to run for council, but you want to make an impact on your community, what are some of the things you can do? In terms of getting involved with the municipal structure, get involved with some of the committees, getting involved with some of the local boards. Uh, uh, people who love libraries love getting on library boards. You might be interested in, in, in other types of board, health units or whatever, uh, do that. But there are also community groups that are active all the time in virtually every community. Get yourself involved with that. You begin to see the workings of, of government that way. And it's really important. Uh, I had someone just the other night say, I don't think I want to run, but I'd like to get involved. And we talked about committees, you know, council committees, because public gets on some of those, and local boards. And this person happened to love libraries. And they said, okay, I'm going to try and get on the library. And the council has a place that we can go to and see all the yeah. that yeah. are On your way out, talk to the clerk. The clerk will give you a sense of what committees and what local boards there are. There was a question over here. One of the, the, the comment was, if you're interested, show up at council meetings. I'm always astounded people who run for council who have never been to a council meeting. You need to subject yourself to that. Um, going through that once may be enough. Uh, you need to see how it functions and how it operates. It's important. That's a really good point. Thank you. Yes. I had never heard of the integrity commissioner until your presentation right now. That was, that was very interesting. As a member of the public, should I, could, should I be aware of that or is that an internal? No, the, the integrity commissioner is appointed by council, by bylaw, and has an obligation to educate the public as well as council on the code of conduct for members. So ask your municipality when that training is going to occur. Any other questions? Well, thank you. I really appreciate your taking the interest and taking the time. And whatever your decision is, uh, I hope this has assisted you in some way having a better understanding of what local government's all about. Thanks. Thank you.